And um, without further ado, Justin, once again, thank you for coming on. Welcome again. The stage is yours. All righty. Thank you. Thank you. Let me see if I could. I do want to share my screen. I didn't. Don't have a lot to present, but I do want to uh, give a little bit about myself and what I've been doing, and and hopefully, you know, a lot of you can learn from some of the things that I've done, some of the uh, uh, pluses, minuses, mistakes, good, bad, and, and the indifference. So let me see if I can uh, find this this presentation and hit share. And okay. Are you guys able to see my screen? I see it loud, nice and clear, nice and clear. All right, so let me change a couple of things because I got some, just do a little bit of cleanup. Okay, so, and, and, and by the way, folks, this is, this is a, um, this is something new that I'm exploring, right? Every so often, you know, I kind of explore different concepts and 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 build on the past, build, look at the present, look at the future, look at the industry, look at things that are going on in and around my community. So I had this concept of build versus buy and why. All right. And it's really an exploration into the vision of building multifamily properties or buying multifamily properties. Does that, does that make sense? So, so really the agenda here is kind of do an introduction. Who am I, projects, you know, areas of growth, focus areas, and we'll close and we'll, we'll have some questions. I also want to take advantage of uh, comments and questions that you guys might have. Um, so feel free to put questions in the chat kind of along the way, because what I want to do for you guys, and, 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 really, and, and this really comes from the heart of not, not what I've read, what I've seen, or what I've this is what I've done, what I've known, what I've bled, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? So if you, have, but, but, but I'll try to monitor the chat as we go. So if you have questions and that type of thing, stick them in the chat and, and then hopefully I can address some of those. So who am I? Uh, Justin Smith, um, the founder of Real Equity Enterprises, which is a development uh, private equity and real estate firm um, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, uh, apologies for a little typo here. Um, so what I've done in my lifetime, or at least in the last, uh, since 1999, you know, I, I really said, hey, okay, I want to focus on multifamily develop, uh, I'm sorry, multifamily acquisition. So I set on this path to buy like a thousand uh, uh, units a year. Um, and this was I don't know, 2019, and I got really, really close to it and really need to, un really had to understand that it's not about just going out buying a bunch of properties and managing them and so on, but it's really about understanding what you're going after um, and understanding that you're managing investor dollars and you're creating, uh, uh, um, you're actually doing the things that you see in many of the LP presentations. Does that make sense? So, so nevertheless, I kind of set, set out on that path, got up to, I'm, I'm, I'm at about 660 units across three, four different states, um, you know, wh which is just, quite frankly, it's just work. And, and so you, then you also start thinking about, okay, well, what do I really want to do and how do I really want to do it and, and, and how do I want to gain some financial independence and all these things start to come, you know, floating around in your head. But anyway, um, the other thing I've done is uh, over the last seven, seven to 10 years has led successful student housing and multifamily housing uh, uh, developments from the ground up. Uh, some have been uh, uh, on campus uh, P3s where you partner with the university and, and you work a deal with the university and others have been off campus deals where you go and you find, you know, uh, uh, seven to 10 acres or two to three acres or heck in Colorado, you know, five houses, you tear them down and you put up you know, 70 uh, units. So did a few of those uh, in places like UC Berkeley, Boise State, Colorado State, Sacramento State, and so on, leading those developments from dirt, what I call dirt to keys, having built over 1,400 units um, of, of student housing and multifamily housing, which equates to about 3,200 beds. And, and I say both because uh, in the eyes of HUD, it might be multifamily. In the eyes of you know private developers, it, it might be purpose-built student housing. In the eyes of what you've actually designed, it might be uh, uh, purpose-built student housing. So 
got a few degrees, got a little older, a tidbit wiser, gained a few pounds, a few inches higher, and um, you know, got a couple of degrees and, and so on. And I've been on boards and teach universities and community colleges and so on, just kind of running around having fun. Um, these are some of the projects that you know I've executed. You know, the, the ones that I just mentioned, Boise State, that was 600, uh, that was 600 units. It was one big giant structure partnering with the University of Sac State was 284 unit. That was 1100 bed, eight buildings right in the middle of COVID. Um, and the one thing that we had to understand, you know, in, in this line of work. So for anybody, and, and I think I heard the young lady saying, um, what was it? I think it was Sherry that was saying, hey, she wants to get into student housing and that type of thing. It's a, it's a great space to be in. So it's a subset of multifamily. But the key is you have to know when to open the building. And in each one of these projects, I had a deadline and a target to, to execute and complete the project on a specific date. And I probably knew that date three years prior to, the, to, the, to that date. So you always have to be right. You always have to be exact and you always have to hit your numbers, uh, hit your dates rather. Um, so I, I do wanna, I wanna talk about that. And, and I kind of weave this presentation, you know, just thinking about uh, just, just having a little fun and thinking about what if you had to get to the moon? Or what if you were an astronaut, right? I think development and development of property is really like exploring a foreign planet, right? And so, so, so just imagine for you, if you will, if, if any of us had to get on a rocket and go to the moon, right? I don't think anybody on this call, including myself, at this point in time, right now, today, would know how to do that. Uh, I, I could be wrong. Maybe Brian knows how to get to the moon or Royal does or uh, Mr. International. You might be, you know, in, in, Mr. Interplanetary. I'm not sure. <laughs> but, I, but I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say, hey, we don't know how to do that, right? But, and so at the same time, we may not know how to build and develop properties. Like, you know, we might have the benefit um, of, 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 you know, my esteemed colleague Yannick on here, who, who's gone out and done a few deals and, and is going to do a whole lot more and, 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 and will eventually take over Baltimore and be a namesake for out there, right? So, but I'm sure he can say as well as, you know, uh, uh, you know, I can also say that, you know, there are twists and turns and uh, along, along the journey, right? I'm not, I'm no astronaut, no scientist, but I can tell you, you know, there, there's will be some new planets to explore, some successes, some, fail, some failures. And in some cases, you might never leave the ground. And you need to know, in some cases, whether to launch or not, right? So then let's talk about that. So, so with respect to going out there, whether you're trying to do a fourplex, a duplex, whether it's buy, or whether you're trying to build a fourplex and duplex, whether it's Atlanta, Baltimore, wherever, you need to figure out where you're going, Earth, space, or another planet. In my case, about four years back, I had properties around the Bay Area. Now. One of the things about the Bay Area is I had to think about was, did I want to stay local? Did I want to go out of the area or did I want to go out of the state? That's a big decision for a lot of different people for a lot of different reasons. And many of us say, hey, you know, just like your grandparents did or, 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 or your grandma that said, hey, you know, you need to be able to kick the tires to drive in that neighborhood and see that property. Well, you can't do that if you're in let's say, uh, uh, um, if, if I'm in Cali California and I go buy a piece of property in, in Fulton County, Georgia, or if I wanna go buy a, 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 a multifamily in PG County, right? I can't do that. I can't just drive around and just find those places. Or if I wanna go up to you know Larimer County, which is outside of Denver, right? You can't just drive it. So, so you need to think about what, what that looks like, right? And then what that looks like for you. Are you there for the journey? Are you there for the landing? Like, you know, because the journey is just like, you know, getting on YouTube, IG, you know, you know, posting up, hey, I'm doing this, I'm closing this deal, I'm doing that. All right, well, well that's fine and that's sexy and that's all good, but are you there for the landing, you know? And, and, and when you land, what will you do? How will you manage that asset? Uh, for the many of us that are out there in the LP world, you know, we think we, we, we also got to think about, you know, I mean, because I see it all the time, like, hey, I'm closing on this deal, I'm doing this deal, or come jumping in this deal. One of the questions that, that it, um, we need to understand is who's managing that deal and how, what is their progress and past on, on managing that deal, right? Um, and 
and, and, and what is their experience there, right? Um, and that may even tell you to, to turn around, go back, abort the mission, or not invest your dollars or, or, or invest your dollars. But, but with respect to getting out there, whether you're going to build or whether you're going to buy, you got to know what particular location you're going to put your, your, your investment in, right? Um, so, and there, uh, so, so the next thing is understanding your financial expectations, right? What is the event horizon? Do you want to, it, it, and I'll equate that to sort of what, what we've heard in the space of uh, financial investing. Do you want a three-year return? Do you want a five-year return? Uh, what's your IRR? What's your yield on capital? Um, things like that, you know, and then, and then the, other, the other quick question you got to ask yourself is, is this a good time to invest? You know, um, is this a good time to invest in, in real estate assets? You know, I had a big, big firm, one of the, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the name brand firms called me up just recently and, and asked, hey, well, um, are you in the market? I said, yeah, I'm in the market, but I'm in the alternative market as well. So, you know, they wanted to know, did they want to, you know, put me in stocks, bonds, mutual funds and things like that. Um, and I said, well, not at, this, not at this point in time. I'm invested in alternate, you know, assets. Would you like to, you know, hey, big firm, you know, and you guys probably seen the, you know, the big name firms that are out there. Uh, hey, would, would you like to put some of your, you know, uh, institutional dollars in some of the projects that I'm doing? Um, and the answer was, well, we like to stick to the traditional markets and so on and so forth. I'm like, okay, the traditional markets and so on and so forth, that's doing 1%, 2% return on their money and so on. So that's a big no, right? So, 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 so just understanding where you want to place your assets, whether if it's in the market, I'm not necessarily knocking the market fully, because if you understand and know how to play that and, and, and deal with that particular market and, and that event horizon, whether it's you know, trading short term or long term or so on meets your return criteria for your retirement or so on, so be it, you know, it's all good. But you do need to understand the opportunity cost of where you place your dollars, you know, and again, your, your yield on capital, your IRRs and so on. And so some of the things that you need to consider with, with respect to financial expectations and usually, usually comes out of pro forma. And, and, and frankly, guys, what I'm not what I'm not doing here, I could, you know, go down the line of showing your pro forma and, and how you evaluate all of that, but I want to keep it, keep it a little simplified so that if there are questions, we can deal with that um, because there's a lot of different areas in this space of, of development, how you do that. But uh, let's get back to, so financial expectations really is what's your return criteria. Um, you know, what do you want to make on the deal and when? And then the other thing that comes up as it re relates to uh, financial expectations is the equity. So usually deals have, uh, have your investment as a GP or the sponsorship team has an equity side and has a debt side. Uh, and on the equity side, it could be different types. It could be MES debt. It could be friends and family. Um, uh, Yannick, in, in, in his conversation with you guys, um, I saw in one of the earlier present talk, talked about friends and family and, and going, you know, to, to, to that source because it's friendly, right? You know, getting capital and that type of thing. Um, there could be, you know, debt structures that are involved, like, you know, your, you know, whether you go through a broker or whether you go through any of the, the, the uh, larger debt firms that actually uh, uh, wants to, you know, provide a, you know, an 80% LTC on your capital or whatever. They might also come with networking, net worth requirements, liquidity requirements, and capital requirements. So, so debt, understanding debt structure and how that all play plays in the in, into the financial projections of that particular opportunity. Um, let's see, uh, Lawrence, are there are any questions in the chat? I want to pause for for a brief moment to see if there's anything out there. Uh, let's see. No, don't. Okay, don't no, see anything. No questions. So, no questions. Okay, so uh, let, let me keep moving. Um, Financial expectations. Uh, sorry, this is this is sort of the, the the next level is beyond financial expectations. But the but but I actually I want to change this to you really your landing your your landing expectations. You know, can you breathe on that planet? Kind of using the you know the 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 astronaut analogy, right? Are you allowed to do to do what you want to do there, or better yet, what can you do there? And so what I'm referring to here is really sort of the, the lay of the land with respect to uh, development. And there's a couple of key things, and, and I'm going to go through a few of them. Uh, this might be a little dense, but I want to go through some of them for you. There's the, 
understanding, let's say you have a plot of dirt, right? The question might come up, what do you wanna do with that plot of dirt? Uh, keep in mind that plot of dirt can also be like a single family home that has a major yard in the back or a single family building with a full acreage to expand or tear it down and put up five or 10 units or so. So either way, whether you buy it or whether you build it, you know, you, you, these considerations will come up. One of which is the general plan zoning. What is that? How is that particular property? How is that area how zoned? Usually get that information from the city and county planning department. Um, you know, you will usually find that information, right? So, that, so that's a good source to really understand what can you do on that plot of land, right? And there may be a lot of rules around it. Um, also within that, you got to understand, you know, there may be a survey that may be needed. And this is sort of some documentation because there may be easements, there may be neighborhood rules, there may be overhead lines, there may be underground lines, there may be transit routes that are underneath you. Um, let's say if you're in a major urban setting, maybe there's, you know, there, there could be, you know, metro, BARTs, trains, and other things that might uh, uh, prohibit the type of things that you can do with that property. So you say, you go in and say, oh, well, that's a cheap piece of land, but hold on a sec. You know, you, you got to see if there's any zoning or rule-based overlays over that piece of property, which is why it might have been vacant for a long period of time. Um, so, so that's one. So number two or B, I think is, is really a market study. And that can come from a consultant, that can come from your own experience, um, that can come from property managers, it can come from websites, Crexy, LoopNet, uh, uh, um, and things like that, where you evaluate what does the market look like? Should I go here? Should I build that, right? And, and these are all sort of, you know, if I step back a minute, these are all the stages of of development consideration, right? And so following this pathway um, is, is something I do on a daily basis. I do with my clients, I've done on, on various projects, but really following a pathway to get you to a decision. And at each point along that pathway, you can you know, determine whether you want to buy it or sell it or buy it at all, or go to the next stage, right? So that being said, experience, Experience. I'm missing some words in here, but nevertheless, I think you guys get where I'm going with that experience. There we go. Okay. Um, competition. Also looking at, um, you know, one thing I like to do when I'm when I when I go in a particular area is look at. Let's say I'm developing a, a multifamily property. Uh, one simple thing I like to do is just look up in the air and see how many cranes I see. Um, so let, let's say you go to like, um, I don't know, downtown Denver. You know, you kind of drive around, you know, I, I love to drive around in the daytime, love to drive around at nighttime. And this, for those of you who are buying real estate or buying, well, let me say, let me say it more clearly, buy multifamily properties, whether it's a single family, a, a, a small multifamily, you know, a, a two to five, or it's 50, 100, drive the property at, in the daytime, drive the property in the nighttime, do both, right? Understand where you are and what you can do and can you breathe on that planet or in that particular location, right? Competition is key. Now, so, so, so a couple of things I just said, uh, uh, look around for cranes. If it's new construction, look around at the neighborhood if it's, if it's multifamily and regular construction. There's some sources that, that will help you out with that. You got your CoStar, you got your LoopNet, you got your Crexy, you got you know, the guy that's down around the corner, you got the coffee shop, you got the restaurant that's, you know, two, three doors away, you know, try to find out what's going on there. You know, blend in, look like the regular folks that are around there and just kind of figure things out from a competitive perspective, right? Um, also talk to property managers and just find out, hey, um, I'm looking for a studio in this area. What, what, what do studios cost, right? It, let's just say it's you buying a five unit with, with five studios. Uh, uh, go talk directly with, with, with property managers. The other thing is, whether it's development or whether it is a property, look at the history and specifically look at the future. What I mean the future is look at the path of progress, right? So the, the history of a, a site will tell you sort of who's there already and what, what's, what's there and, and what's around. But then you look at the path of progress. 
I'm going to tell you three, three, three things, folks. And, and, and this is when, you know, I used to buy single families and I stopped buying single families because I got tired of banging my head up against the wall and having people calling me on a nine o'clock, you know, on a Friday night with a busted water heater. And I'm trying to go to the Warriors game. Right. So um, three, three, three things. Um, buy on the hillside, buy in the path of progress. And there's one more uh, buy on the water side. Right. So I, I just kind of took those things as, as kind of, you know, what I looked at. And path of progress is one that always stood out, particularly from a development perspective, because if you're looking at a block, let's just say, you know, at most most major most, uh, um, um, state cities um, have a major downtown building or something. Maybe it's a city hall or something like that. Right. And at some point in time, if you kind of look at the various boulevards, going left, right, north, or south, you can kind of see where they start to build build out from there. That's just historically. But then where does it go after that, right? Um, and I know redlining and all of that and, and all those particular concepts of building and, and, and designing some of our cities have been, you know, uh, um, tinkered with, with, you know, by by many, but, but never does understand that. Now, where can you get that information? Articles, blogs, neighborhood organizations, rotary clubs, and things like that to really understand what's in that neighborhood, right? Some of it you can get from reports. Um, the other is this political and, and people environment, right? So what, what clubs, city leaders, uh, stakeholders, you know, who, who can you find out, you know, who, who, who knows the goings on of what's goings on, right? Um, and, and understanding that with respect to that, because you're about to plop down a lot of money uh, either in, into that development or into that particular uh, 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 new construction. Uh, and so you'll be on the hook as well as, you know, you put your investor dollar, your investors on the hook as well uh, with respect to that, right? So the other thing is, uh, let me pull this up just a tad bit, but the other thing is the demographics, right? And there, 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 there's a lot of sites out there. I like to use one called uh, City Data. I think it's citydata.com or what have you. But that gives you a lot of demographic information down to streets, blocks, zip codes, and that type of thing. And you can see what the economics of a particular area is, you know, income. You can look at uh, 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 racial statistics. Um, you can look at a lot of data, you know, like I said, down to the block, zip code, and really understanding those, you know, economics. And then, you, then, then there's obviously some data out there on the, on that particular site, which deals with, uh, you know, what's there. Is it walkable? Is it rentable? Is it even desirable, right? And, and so there's a lot of sites out there that, you know, and PropStream and Apartments.com or some of the rental sites can kind of tell you that, depending on what it is you're trying to do. Are you trying to build at that site or you kind of buy at that site, right? So uh, hopefully that gives you guys a good idea of some, some, some of the thought processes. Okay, well, where do we want to land? And, and then, you know, and, and, and by the way, you know, in the development world, you know, this could cost you six months and $600,000. But you get to a decision where, you know, it, it, that's how this works. That's how this works. You go, you go a couple of other stages, and it could take you to a million dollars, and then you still may make a a, a no go decision. So then, so then, really, um, the next level is really uh, 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 creating creating the shuttle, right? Or create creating the spaceship. Like, you know, where do you want to do your deals? You know, is 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 it in the three lows or the three X's? Now, many of you talk about, and many of us have heard. The three lows, uh, uh, location, location, location. You know, from a development perspective, I have a couple of more threes. I call it exploration, 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 because I'm trying to figure out where is the highest, best use for my concept it, 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 for a particular site, right? So I'm in the business of building student housing. The bigger, the better. 100 units. 200 units, 300 units, 500 units. Um, one project um, uh, we did at the University of um, University of Hawaii, the Manoa campus, 14 stories, um, and it was right right in the area. If any of you've been to Honolulu or, or been in that area, it's right in the Pucks Alley area. A great project called Hale Mahana, um, but we really had to understand all of the things I just talked about on the previous slide, and then build that into the design of the new uh, of this particular building. Yes, we had resistance from neighbors and things like that, 
So we had to really understand based on our research, does this deal make sense? What type of environment, what size of units do you want? 200 square foot units or 300 square foot units, or do you want two bedrooms, one bedroom, three bedrooms, or do you want laundry in the room, outside of the room? So you really have to do your research to figure out what makes sense for this particular deal. Now that's development. So, so now on the other hand, for multifamily, usually that's already, usually you know that. You, usually it's already built in. You're going to buy a 15 unit deal, right? So then you say, okay, well, you know, it, it's, it's twos, threes, and ones. So you got to make the determination. Can you, is this a value add play? Is this a management play or is this a turnover play? Value add very simply, and some of you might, might know this already, but value add is where you take the property and you do some improvements and you increase the value through uh, in, uh, um, a raising rents or, or other uh, type of improvements, right? Um, a management play um, or management add is where you know that the owners of the property is managing it in a way that you can improve upon it, right? Um, and that might be, you know, if you if you think if you put your hat on in terms of seeking out deals, that might be deals that you don't get from a broker, um, uh, and, and you might uh, do your own uh, sourcing of deals. So so like PropStream, where you go into a particular area and you know pull up you know, all the properties that are of this size that are in zip, this zip code or in this particular area. And I want to source that and see if those folks want to sell, right? So, so, so you got your value add play, you got your management play. Um, and then in some case, you, you just have, you know, a situation where it's just a, it, it's a buy and um, it's a buy, it's, it's a class A property and has very, you know, good bones, has, it's, it's a decent property and you just want to buy it and 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 take advantage of the appreciation from that, right? So, B, what structure do you want to build? So, so you got to think about that from a from a development perspective. Is it garden style? Is it high rise? Is it uh, a single family? Um, is it medium rise? Um, you know, and 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 some of these type of considerations again, leaning back on your your understanding of that particular market should dictate and determine what type of density or what type of size you're going to do, right? Um, environmental factors, right? Wind, seismic, ground, adjacencies, traffic, transportation, all of these particular things come into play with respect to how you want to build and how you want to develop that particular structure. Um, and, and quite frankly, any one of these points can be taken into like a whole uh, uh, two-hour session which deals with these points. But I, I want to keep it sort of high level. And I want to keep it, you know, at a point where you guys kind of understand that, hey, there, there's a lot going on out there. And again, for multifamily, a lot of this stuff is is taken care of for you because, you know, the property's been there. You know, if, if it's a class, like you guys know, there's a class A, B, and C properties, right? The class A is was built, you know, three to five years ago. Class B, probably, you know, five, eh, it's more like seven to maybe 10, 15 years ago, and your class C is like all the old stuff built like from 1970 or so to like now. So that might be anywhere from, you know, 20 to 30 years old. And your class D is usually, you know, really, really beat up. You know, that might have some some environmental issues that might have some property issues and so on. But nevertheless, um, uh, you, you know, those are things that are already, so, so some of these factors here may not be as relevant with respect to uh, um, you know, buying a multifamily property makes sense. So, so then, so then, getting back to okay, well, what what type, what type of building type is it, right? Um, is it type one concrete and steel, and is that what I'm building, or is it type four mass timber CLT? There are other there, there's a two and three. I just can't remember off the top of my head, but these are the threes that that I deal with most often from a from a design and development perspective, right? Um, and then there's a type five wood frame construction. Now the the interesting piece of this, which which I really enjoy, is that is is from a building perspective, um, uh, environmental and sustainable concerns are really starting to come into play. Like there are certain municipalities that will not allow you to even uh, bring gas to an area. Like like um, you know new buildings now in in certain cities. I think uh, let's see what what was the name of it. I want to say it would be the San Jose or, or another city right here in the Bay Area. But they basically said any new building needs to have be all electric, right? 
So, you know, the, the good old fashioned, you know, a uh, uh, gas stove where you, you know, hear the ticking, you turn it on and your flame comes on. No, cannot happen. And, and that will start to grow in popularity, right? So you need to understand those things with respect to that. Um, and then that also might dictate, you know, uh, what, what natural resources are available on that site. And, and do you put PV, you know, to offset some of the energy use since it's going to be all electric and all of that, right? So uh, other, uh, those are some of the considerations. And, and I also like this idea of mass timber and CLT from the perspective that um, it, it, it's, a, it, it's, it's, it, it, it's a new technology, it's a fast technology, and um, it's very environmental, um, you know, where they take, you know, just like you have steel and concrete girders and beams and so on, you do all that from a mass timber perspective. And there's some conferences that I'm going to start studying because I have a, a affordable housing project right here in the Bay Area that I'm embarking on, which will be using um, that mass timber structure. So so very interested in kind of seeing, and, and it's new, like, you know, the, the, the first, uh, the, the tallest mass timber structure just broke ground last week in in uh, Oakland, California. Um, uh, and, and so so this is a bit, we're on a very new frontier with respect to that. Um, so look out for that. That's something I want to feature uh, in, in some of the future things that I do. So uh, creating and, and building, you know, the, the space shuttle, right? Um, the, the, the real big thing here is, is understanding the risks of a project or a property, right? So for development, the understanding the risk usually falls in three categories, scope, budget, and schedule. You need to have your finger on the pulse of those three items. Now, not all three items will dictate. For example, in the student housing project, um, uh, for example, the Sac State project that I did, we started that from a design perspective in, and let me think, let me think back to that. We started that design in, in 2018. But we knew back in 2018 that we had to hit 8, 27, 21. So we knew that the overriding factor was schedule. Now, budget is important and scope is important, but we knew that we had to hit 8, 27, 21 because we need to meet the fall. So, so in development projects, usually there's a there's an overriding factor. There's one particular area that that carries the most weight, right? And you have to sort of uh, align your project, uh, you know, accordingly. In 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 multifamily projects, there's a lot of different factors. So, so I, I, my thoughts based on the ones that I'm dealing with is is risk, asset, and capital. Now you can kind of arrange that back and forth, but but risk is is really what's the risk? You know, should I even do this deal? Who should I do this deal with? Who are my partners? Who am I? You know, what am I? You know, really understand where is this project? You know, what are my? What is the competitive environment? You know, what what's the what, what's the uh, returns that I can get from it? What are the rents like? Can I raise rents? What is the neighborhood like? Is it declining neighborhood? Is it upcoming neighborhood? Is it class A, B, and C? Right, and then the asset itself. Um, uh, really rolls into that because the asset is answering all of those questions. I have a risk. I need to answer it with the asset. Hopefully, the asset comes up with good answers. And then at the and then and then this might be on the front side of where am I going to get the money to do this deal? You know, they, what, what do they call it? Uh, 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 OPM or other people's money, right? Well, you need to also put your own money in it because you know some investors might ask you that question. Hey. How much money you got in the deal? Like you going around saying, hey, you know, you want all these LPs, 100K, 50K, this and that, and this and that. But, you know, and, and for those of you who are on the other side of the table, you should ask that question. How much you got in the deal, sir, ma'am? You know, um, you know, uh, how much are you guys put in the deal? You know, I, I just heard your presentation. Um, you know, it was great. Um, you guys are getting, you know, these fees and that and this and that. Okay, well, what about the capital? What does the capital structure look like? What does the capital returns look like? You know, ask those hard questions, right? If, if you're on the LP side or if you're considering investing in a deal. But, but nevertheless, I think from a multifamily perspective, you know, risk, asset, and capital are the key pieces that you really have to understand. You really have to control um, or or know that someone on your GP team is controlling 
those specific areas of the deal. Now you can expand that e even further. You know, there's there's banking relationships that someone needs to manage. There's there's property manager relationships that somebody needs to manage. Um, there's there's the financial uh, uh, responsibility that that needs to be managed. Um, there's the there's the tenants. You know, because hey, at at, at, the, at the beginning, end, and start of the day. In middle of the day, it's your tenants that need to be happy. So how are you taking care of your tenants in those particular projects? How are you building community, right? And so if you think about it from that particular level, I am building community. I'm buying communities and I'm making communities better. Now, if you kind of think about it from that, that, that turns this whole adage of us kind of saying, oh, we want, we want mailbox money with this. No, 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 let's stop. You know, let, how are you making communities better? You know, I, I kind of I like to live off of you know three C's: um, community, cash flow, and collaboration. Because without those three, I really can't do the things that I'm I'm trying to do, right? If Lawrence says, "Hey, you know, I, I heard you want to do something in Atlanta or, or North Carolina, we should talk," right? What he's talking about really is collaboration. What he's saying is, "Hey, you look, I." We need to talk about how we can co collaborate to make some things happen, to create some cash flow. So you and he uh, collaborate on a deal or talk about a deal. You bring in some cash flow. Well, you, you create cash flow to you know with, with that particular deal, um, but but you're not going to get either one of those without building that community. So you got to think about that base because that's where your money's coming from, right? And if folks are not happy, guess what? What you're going to see in your occupancy and your vacancy numbers. It, it, it's a, it's going to be a direct a direct reflection of that. So then, so so speaking of that direct reflection, like whether it's a you know a, a multifamily deal, and and for for my development deals, usually I get to this point and I turn over the keys, you know, and or, or sell the deal, right? Turn over the keys to the operation team if I'm if I'm partnering with the group that is developing the property, you know, th then they bring in the asset management group or or I bring in the property management group, or I flat out sell the deal, which is what I've done in, in most cases where you just sell the deal, right? Um, and, and, and you get put in, in, in that sort of your, your, your venture developer cat category, right? Um, or if you're thinking about sort of that, that, that long-term appreciation and so on, you could stay in the deal and uh, you know, continue to ride along. And then at some point in time, you can, you can get your interest bought out or, or you can sell out your interest. And then, but, but what this all boils down to is really having a defined decision-making process where you assess your requirements, you create solutions, you select that solution, and then you assess whether or not that was the right solution. And you kind of roll that back and forth. Now, and you might do that a series of times, and this is really, you know, really central to the decision making process and should be done at each stage. And in each stage, you should understand what is my off ramp, right? You know, uh, uh, from let's say you had a, a small property or, or and you want to develop into 10 units, right? Uh, the first step is getting it entitled. And then you might want to sell it or you might want to keep it, but you've done the entitlement stage. Well, I, actually, the first step step is acquisition and then entitlement. And then the next stage is, you know, construction documents. Each one of these stages has a, has a series of dollars associated with it. And then the next stage is actually constructing it. And then, and, and there's a lot of risk in each, and particularly in the, in the construction phase. And then after construction, it's continued ownership and asset management. And, it, and, and, then, and then it could be sell it or keep it or so on, right? And then it kind of falls into the realm of you know the multifamily. So, so from a development perspective, those are the those are the stages. Each one of those stages has a should have an increasing level of value, should have an opportunity for you to assess whether you want to get off the, the train at that point or you want to stay on and go to the next stage and build more value. But 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 in any event, Throughout any of those stages, you should be, you know, assessing the requirements, the solutions, selecting a solution or not. A yes or go, so yes or no is a decision. No is a decision, and in some cases, it is a good decision. Um, and then you reassess that and you move on. So, um, 
I want to open it up for questions. I don't want to talk all night, but but that 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 in a nutshell has been, has been my experience. Um, I've gone through this over and over, um, and you know I, I'm just I, I stay humble to stay blessed, um, and I really appreciate you know you guys for listening. Um, here's my 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 website and and my my uh, email address. So if you got questions or things like that, please reach out to me. You know what I'm interested in doing now. I'm still looking for. Uh, uh, I, I like student housing, so um, you know one of the projects that I have right now is at an HBCU. Um, one of the things that I found is that uh, uh, historically black colleges and university have been underserved with respect to capital, with respect to housing, and with respect to a lot of different needs. So um, I'd like to you know start one college at a time and sort of turn that around. Um, so um, I got one 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 project that's on the drawing board that we're looking at and we're, we're raising capital and then doing some things for to make that deal the right type of deal. Um, given the current climate of interest rates and things like that, you know, we've really had to muscle through that, you know, quite frankly, you know, the larger universities that you're all familiar with, um, you know, developing at those sites are typically easier, um, are typically uh quicker to capital, you know, you know, because quicker to attract capital with the 15,000 and 20,000 um, uh, uh, student universities. When you start talking about the, you know, the 10,000 student or the 7,000 student, you know, universities, eh, you know, investment is, you know, investment, whether it's capital or debt, I mean, I'm sorry, whether it's equity or debt is a little bit harder to, to attract. Um, then you throw on the layers of of, of neighborhood, community, um, you know, and, and the social ills that we know as America in terms of racism and so on, um, that makes it really mixed bag. But nevertheless, you know, um, we, 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 we still rise, we still get up, we still go after it. And um, that's, you know, that's what I'm going for. So again, I wanna open it up to questions. Um, whether it's you know buying multifamily or whether it's you know building a multifamily, um, want to be a resource to you. Thank you, Justin, for a great, great um, presentation. Can you please stop sharing the screen? Yep. There you go. Done. Thank you. So I have a question for you because uh, th this what you just what you just spoke about what you just presented, right? This can go for Small multifamily, residential multifamily. Yes. Multifamily. Yep. So it's the same process, no matter what, and by purchasing it and titling, getting the getting the getting the, getting the, the, the um getting all the all your ducks lined up to yep. for the land use and everything else. Yep. Okay. Now you're, you're you're exactly right. That that and, and that's why I try to speak on that con continuum. And I'll say it again, you know, acquisition. Um, Entitlements, design, mm -hmm. development, construction, operations, and asset management mm -hmm. is really the continuum and the and the life cycle of of any building. You know, um, for us as multifamily investors, we, we're typically jumping in at the asset management or the or the operational phase and not seeing all of the work before it. Um, which is why things kind of cost so much or which is why certain things happen or, you know, or whatever the case might be, but you're right. Brian has a question. Brian asks, what tools or resources do you use to help evaluate where and how you determine shell locations, i property selections? Well, um, from, a, from, from a where and determining sites, yeah. I've been studying the student housing market for a number of different years. And, that, and, and from that, I understand what universities need housing. And so I went through an exhaustive metrics, very similar to, to what I did with, with finding the right multifamily site. Mm -hmm. you know, but I went through this metric of very simply, if a university has 15,000 students and they can only house, let's say, 10,000 students. That means there's a 5,000 student difference in, in housing. That means there's 5,000 students that are, 
that are that are commuting in that are living in hotels, that are living in their cars, that are living, you know, uh, 10 miles away, five miles away, three, you know, three miles away and so on. And there's a whole bunch of those universities out there. Mm -hmm. And so I've just gathered a list of all of those. And, and I'll tell you, one of which is, is, you know, is, is right here in my backyard, UC Berkeley. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, kids are coming from everywhere, living in cars, living in, by the side of the road, living, double level a one bedroom might have four kids in it you know somebody's living in a in, in the sleeping in the living room and somebody's in the garage because the garage has been converted and all that and i'm pretty sure there's a whole bunch of other you know, universities out there that are this in that same boat so 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 in terms of where and determining that i look at that first because that's the fertile and most ripest ground for that particular opportunity and then i start looking at those other uh, environmental or, or neighborhood or uh, or city regulatory constraints to, to 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 then determine whether or not that's the right place to be. Thank you. That makes sense. Makes sense. Makes sense. Okay. Um, Yannick has a question here. Yes, how can someone who's transitioning to multifamily development understand how to estimate development costs? Um, transitioning from from multi from well. From, from multifamily to development? Yes. Yeah, there, there's a couple of ways to do that. Uh, one way is um, talk to a GC or partner with the GC or get that information from, from somebody who is directly building that type of product. Um, another way is to uh, a cost estimator. Like there's, there's cost estimating firms that, you know, you pay them a couple of bucks because that's what they do. They have that body of information, just like the GC, they have that body of information and they can determine what the costs are. Um, a, another way is to talk to developers or you know, people in and around the business, brokers, and sometimes they gather that information up as they're preparing a particular site. Well, for example, in Texas, there's a lot of land all over the place, right? And there's a lot of brokers sort of say, hey, look, I got two acres here, I got four acres here, I got five acres here. And some of them might indicate in some of their literature what the cost to build is. Now, that's now, now you, you do have to take some of that with the with the grain of salt in some respect, and, 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 and no disrespect to any brokers that are on the line. But 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 their goal is to sell that particular property, not not necessarily give you the best, you know, and most useful uh, information as a really see that to that. But but that's a source of data. Um, another source of data could be like your co-stars and, and your your in, in uh, um, your, your your research houses that might gather that information. They might say, okay, type five wood frame construction in this particular area might cost you know roughly 180 a square foot. Where versus in, in in Portland, Oregon, it might be 380 a square foot. Or in Seattle, it might be 410. Bay Area it might be 450, right? And so, you know, I'm throwing out those numbers, but they're not too far from the truth, right? Or not too far from where the actual number is. But but there there are various sources again: uh, uh, cost estimators, general contractors, uh, brokers, um, uh, follow trends and data. Um, research houses and things like that. Those are kind of five sources which I bounce all around to try and figure out. Um, and once I triangulate on a particular site, I really zero in on what that cost is. Thank you. I like I like what you I like what you said about the three C's: community, cash flow, and collaboration. Yes, sir. Um, has there been any time? This, this is a side. Has there been any time where you know you've practiced you you've practiced the community cash flow collaboration, you've practiced all these three C's, you've done all your homework and everything went south yeah, anyway. Yes. Yes. Because um, real estate has or can have two problems. And I see Angel Williams is on the line. She can probably, you know, commiserate me with, with, with what I'm about to say. Real estate usually has two problems. It usually has property problems and it has people problems. And sometimes we create people problems just for no freaking reason other than our own people issues. Mm -hmm. And so from the 3C perspective, you, you could have found the right opportunity, found the right deal. It has the right IRRs and the right returns. And then the people jump into it and you get somebody in that particular deal on the GP side, 
that don't want to hold up their side of the bargain, that are not trustworthy, that are not uh, uh, honest, or, or that may want to see things a little bit different. Or when things get hot and there's a capital call, they may act a little funny. It, whatever the case might be, yes, you can have a perfect deal until it runs into people problems. Or you could have a perfect deal and then a storm hits, right? And now it has property problems. So you can hit the three C's and still run into the two P's. <laughs> okay, thank you, man. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's two questions here. First question is from um, Royal. On average, is a student housing annual NOI higher or equal to the same size apartment housing? That's the first, first part of it. And the second question is, are you contracted to the university or directly to the students? Um, let's see, on average, is the student housing and I higher or equal to the same? Size apartment housing. Um, it can be, it, 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 it can be. Typically, it, and, and I say that with, with some level of caution because it's not just consistent, but, but here's an example. If I have a three bedroom house in I don't know, some city, right? Atlanta, let's just use Atlanta, right? A three bedroom house in, um, no, no, I'm gonna use Houston. So a three bedroom house in Houston might, you might be able to rent it out for $2,000, right? So you got three bedrooms, $2,000, boom, that's what you're gonna get. Now, let's just say that, three bedroom was near a university and you want to rent out those three bedrooms at, I don't know, $800 a piece, right? Mm -hmm. So the rent there is what, 2,400? Did I do my math right? So, so you're, you should be able to get better rents because you're renting it by the bed. So you may be able to afford a higher, a better NOI because of that fact. And that's why people like student housing. And that's why you see properties, single family houses, it could be a two bedroom, cut up four different ways and five different ways, jamming all these students in there because they can only get $1,200 if they rent out the house, but if they have five students in there, they can get $2,500 because students generally don't really care about where they, I mean, they do to a certain extent, but look, they just there to study, party and, and go to school. So that single family house, you know, that you're selling, that you're renting out for 2000 can probably go for 2,400 or you, or, or one that you cut up in all different goofy ways, um, and certain municipalities will frown upon that, by the way. Um, but nevertheless, if you have space in place and you can make it happen, yes, you can increase the NOI. The other part of that question was, you know, are you directly contracted with university or, or the students? Um, it, it, it depends on what your relationship, if it's a P3 relationship where I'm partnered with the university, that contractual relationship is with the, is, is, is university to the students. And that's the, that's the one I like to have because I own the property, the university stuffs it with students. I operate it. I manage it. Students go to school. Boom. Good operations, right? That's sort of your partnership. Um, if, if, if it's off, and that's an on-campus deal, right? If it's off campus where you have a, a 50 unit apartment across the street from campus, that's private and you're directly, um, it, it's just, you're leased uh, directly to the students but one equals three. And here's what I mean by that, because that lease is usually co-signed by the parents. So in, in multifamily, that one lease goes to that one household. In student housing, I got three people to go after if somebody don't pay their rent. Little Johnny, little Shirley, didn't pay their rent. Shirley, Johnny, pay up. Wah, 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 wah. I can't, okay, where's your mama? Two, wah, wah, wah. where's your daddy? He gonna pay the rent because he wants you at school, not at his house. So one equals three. So I got three people to go after in the event somebody's not paying their rent. Does that make sense? So from a multi, from a student perspective, I like it a little bit better. I like going after three people before I have to go down to the courthouse. Mm. So there's another question here. 
from um, Domicio. What has been the investor mix and typically how do you finance your projects? Uh, financing projects is a mixed bag. Um, it could be traditional where you where you bring in and you know, I've done a number of types. I've done the syndications where you know you you you, you post the syndication or or you do a 50, uh, 506, uh, what is it, 506 C um deal where you, you kind of bring in investor done those type where you have GP and LP and you kind of have a nice little split and return and so on. The, the, then there are the other deals where you where your where your LP is one giant block where that might be um a a, a prep equity firm or something like that, which has a large percentage of your property. Um, an, another, another way of doing deals, uh, which I've done as well, is partnerships like with with institution with with REITs or institutional capitals, right? And th and that um, can be a, a good thing because that particular capital source is usually large. They usually have all the money, and you're kind of, you know, it's like. You, you got a sugar mama, you know, you just rolling in the deal, right? I mean, but you have to make sure it happens, but you do have, you know, larger resources in a re or larger resources in a uh, family office or a large firm that can help, you know, uh, put that deal together. Um, and then I've done the deals where, you know, it's coming all out of my pocket, you know, I'm paying for engineers, paying for architects, you know, paying for all these different things. Um, and, and like I said, the ones I prefer is, you know, OPM, obviously, but, you know, OPM with my money, plus my experience, plus, you know, um, you know, smart people along the, you know, smart people on your board or smart people on your team and so on and, and so forth uh, really does help. So I've done all three types of deals. Okay, there's one, there's another question here from Sh Sherry, Sherry Brown Grosner. Mm -hmm. Is there a threshold of the number of units that one should invest in with student, student housing or the numbers just need to work? Let the numbers talk to you. Uh, the numbers need to work. Um, and, and and whatever you're comfortable, you know, with is, is sort of secondary, like number of units and that type of thing. If you're, if, if, depending on where you are, um, the number of units and the amount to invest could, could could be analogous. I mean, it could, could be the same, right? It, but we're really, whether you're putting fifty thousand dollars in a in a deal at Kansas State, which might be less in value than fifty thousand dollars in a deal at Texas A and M, which might be larger, more in value, the return might be the same. So it's really important to stay disciplined do and run the numbers for them to work for you. Mm. I think that I think that's really important. You, you have to be you have to be disciplined in this business, right? Because you can easily lose your money um, or you can easily, you know, have to push off some, you know, that cash, that mailbox money might be the next quarter or the next quarter, so on. But but you do have to be disciplined and understand, you know, um, how the deal is going to be managed, how the money will be cycled through the deal, uh, who's getting fees, and, and so on. So people, so try to be as disciplined as possible with respect to um, the returns and, and and the financial outcome of, of any opportunity. See, we got a long one. Yes, how would you model the exit? How would you model the exit in a tier three student housing market? Let's see. Okay, you're looking to lock up a market rate uh, conversion from 100 to 366. Okay, so you're adding 200 units master lease. Okay, that's nice. That's that's a that's a that's music to my ears. The master lease piece as they become available. Wondering how would that play into the exit? Ten bit expansion. Would you do something more conservative, considering long term master lease? Uh, will be on the deal. It well, it, there's a there's a lot there. The, the, the first piece, and I don't know if everyone understands master lease, but master lease is a situation, like I said, where you own the property and the university. You you get a lease with the university to basically rent it. You you instead of going room by room by room, you got 366 units, and you're renting a whole 366 to the university, off top, right? That's a master lease. Um, now getting from 166 to two, to 366, there must be some, you know, I, I know there's no, you know, magic formula in there. So you must be either building or expanding, um, cause you can't cut the building up that, 
that much. Well, well you went we're from units. Added, to beds, we're so just maybe. adding beds. We're just adding so, beds. So, so you're just adding beds. So you, you either you either have big, 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 big bedrooms where you're doing bunks or doubles or triples. Yeah, doubles. Or like playing that. with doubles and singles. To playing get with to doubles that. and singles to get to that. No, I mean, and that's nice. And if that particular, if, if the getting back to the market, if the market need is there, yes, you can do that. If the if the if a master lease is there to do that, yes, do that. Um, it, now, now I think your your question is on. Uh, um, yeah, I guess my uh, question exit is strategy? the exit is, you know, mm -hmm. obviously here are three student markets, student housing markets, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. are a little, uh, you know, uh, a little bit more risky from the enrollment mm -hmm. perspective that you mentioned, a 10,000 versus a, you know, a 20 or 30 or some of those, you know, tier one markets. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how you would model the exit on that, you know, given that, you know, it does, would potentially have the, the master lease into you know the property um from an investor's perspective if someone was looking mm -hmm. at it you know yeah. i i would say this I, I would say that if you can lock in a master lease in your deal your exit is very nice you you're you're, you, you're building in your exit right i mean it, it's it's a great place to be for two perspectives a you can exit and sell it to someone who wants the coupon clippings or who wants that 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 reoccurring revenue that's going to come from that master lease um or b you could keep it and um so you could sell it outright that has value uh, you can keep it and hold on to it for two or three years and, and make sure your expectations you know uh, um c come into play and then sell it at some point in time in the future um and then there's a third option which has to do with doing a bond finance deal. It's a little bit more trickier, um, but with that mass lease, you, you can do some bond financing arrangements where you can you know, sell the bond and, and do other different things. But um, the, the, the key there is, is mass leasing. That's, that's the key. And if you yeah. can get that, yeah, you, you're set. So I mean, if you, and if you want to talk talk more about you know how how that can be arranged or you know some things like that, you know, feel free to reach out. Sounds good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I think there's a oh no no question. So um, I, uh, Lawrence, I don't know how much time you have or, or how, how you want to go. Um, but I'm but I'm here. You're on mute. Thank you. I was going <laughs> to follow the directions. I, uh, I was going to say thank you again. Does anybody have any more questions? I know you get you're busy and you got things to put you on the West Coast, which means there's still a lot of day left out there. Right? It, it, it's still a lot of day left. I got I gotta go. Um, I'm teaching at a a college here in in San Francisco, so I got oh, a class my, tonight. My message, about this, my message about please take yourselves off off take off, off, turn your cameras on, please. Take your video, put your video on so I can take a, a, a quick picture of everybody, please. If you if you're available, everybody should be available, unless you're driving. Anybody else? Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Yannick? Tiffany? Sherry? Nancy? Okay, I mean, that must mean no. So, on the count of three, one, two, three. One more time again, one, two, three. Thank you, Sherry. Very good, thank you very much. And um, once again- I see there's- Hmm? Is there one more? Okay. I see there's, yeah, there's one, one, one last question. I'm yeah. answering uh, quickly for those who, uh, uh, how, how do you level up your knowledge from single family to, to developer? Um, the, 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 you can study it, but for me, it's been a passion. You know, this is not something I, I just started doing three years, four years ago. You know, I, I've been in this business for, for 20 plus years, you know, I've got my, and, and so for me, some of these things, you know, just kind of roll off my tongue and I can kind of deal with certain elements because it's just, I don't know, it's just what I do. And 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 this is not fly by night for me. Um, so with respect to understanding, you know, the knowledge of single family to develop, you know, I, I just had to do it. I was one of those learn by doings. I went out and bought a bunch of single family houses, you know, bought and sold and some, some went well, some went south. You know, some had tenant problems, some had good problems, and some made a lot of money. Some I had to sell on par, right? Um, so you know, it's just, it's just 
that's it's just kind of that business. You know, I got I got hit with the 2008. I didn't lose um, uh, very bad. I was I was fortunate enough that you know I could sell off certain assets that were not not performing well, um, and then I just kind of laid low, um, and then I jumped back and jumped back in it at a much bigger level. Uh, how far in advance are you performing research, 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 especially out of state before you drive around? Um, I usually don't drive a neighborhood until I get it in contract. You know, that when I get it in contract, I'm buying an airplane ticket. Um, and that's just kind of my rules. But 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 before that, if I have a knowledge of the area, you know, if I have collab if I'm collaborating with asset managers, property managers in the area, if I've called on it, I've Googled it, I've done the research, I know all, I've triangulated where the property is, I've done all this research, I might understand, you know, you know, if it's in a particular area that I'm unfamiliar with, I find somebody, a LP, a GP, that's why it's good to have friends all over the place that you know that can help you with understanding that particular area. But as soon as I get in contract, I'm going to see it. I, I got I to gotta kick tires and, you know, knock on doors. Not sooner than that, because, you know, you, you usually, you know, that, that's an expense, right? You know, you want to you manage your expenses as well, because you'd be getting on a whole lot of planes for a whole lot of dud deals if, if if you don't have some level of discipline or some level of approach that would make sense for you. Now, if you want to go drive and, you know, if you're in, if you're in Texas and you live in, you know, let's say Austin or whatever, you know, you're kind of in this, I don't want to say center of the state, but you can kind of get, get to all these different places, which is good, but I'm in California, you know, so I got to get on a plane anyway, whether it's Phoenix, Arizona, whether it's Des Moines, Iowa, or Columbus, Ohio, or Reno, Nevada, anyway, go, I got to get to a plane. So. Well, I'm going to say, Justin, thank you again for coming on. I know the run. Um, God bless. And once again, I want to thank everybody for coming on tonight um, and being a get being a, be a um, attendee here at Financial Independence to Small Multifamily Investing.